Uh, good morning, everybody. A formal welcome to the CDMG meeting for uh, for March. Um, I know already which we do have a quorum. Before we start, I'm required to read the statement to you. I remind members that the meeting is being recorded and that a recording will be made available on the Bay of Plenty Regional Council website following the meeting. I also remind all present that local government decision making affords no protection to elected members, council officers, and the public for comments made during the meetings that are subsequently challenged in a court of law and determined to be slanderous. But to that, that gets that out of the way. Right, on to apologies. Firstly, Commissioner Ann Tolley. Uh, now, we do have uh, Commissioner Rolleston representing Anne. Uh, but just to, to make the point that the statute actually requires the member or the alternate. So, uh, comes Commissioner Austin can play the fullest possible part, uh, as far as I'm concerned, as a chairman, but he can't vote. And so that's the only difference. But, Chad, you know, you really are welcome to, to be a, just a full member of the committee, as far as I'm concerned, in, in every other respect. Um, yeah, can I just uh, please give my uh, apologies for my deputy, Failing Tanui, please? Yeah, will do. Yeah, and David Donaldson is also um, is also not, not attending today, but that's fine since we we do have the said, big chief attending. So. Right, so can I have, um, I'd also like to welcome uh, Jackie Sinko, who is the NEMA regional representative. This is, she did attend the last meeting in, in an advisory role, but this is her first full meeting in, in her own right. Right, so can I have somebody to move those apologies, please? So Hello. Lynn, thank you very much. Seconded by Steve. Uh, uh, Chadwick, right, thank you. All those in favor, raise your hand. Thank you. Uh, public forum is not advised. Items not on the agenda, not advised. There is a change to the order of business. Um, item 7.6. Um, we have received some late correspondence from Lima, which we need to discuss before, which you've probably seen before the meeting with the minister, which we're invited to next Wednesday. Uh, the paper which we have received is uh, in confidence, so we are going to have to move into public excluded for that particular item. So item 7.6, I am going to move into uh, public excluded in entirety, and that will be that will be the last, last item on the agenda. Right. De declarations of conflicts of interest, are there any? Thank you. Um, Bay of Plenty Civil Defence Emergency Management Joint Committee Minutes 17th December 2021. Are there any matters arising? Right, can I have somebody move confirmation of the minutes? Thank you, Deputy Mayor Isles and Mayor Turner. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Gary. Correspondence, we're on to item 7.1. Uh, I'd have you move the recommendation. I second it. I thought I had, but not to worry. All those in favour, put the stranger hand. Thank you. Right, moving on. Um, Item 7.1, correspondence received. The, there, is, there is some correspondence between Minister Mahuta and ourselves regarding the uh, coordinating executive group. Clinton, over to you to explain this one, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. The letter from uh, the Minister of Local Government is attached. Um, that is in response to a letter that Councillor uh, Love sent through as chair of joint committee, inviting the minister to be a member of the joint com uh, of the joint committee um, last year, and further inviting uh, the minister to appoint officials to the coordinating executive group. 
the current legislation doesn't require the minister, who is the territorial authority for offshore islands, to be a group uh, member of the group. As a consequence, the minister's written back after taking advice to decline the offer to be on the joint committee, but accepted the offer to appoint officials to KEG, the Kuna Executive Group, with the chief executives, as well as the subcommittee of the KEG local authorities. Um, and those appointments have been made. So, and as a consequence of this, um, the minister gave us notice in that letter that the current or the MOU at the time for the Cardi White Island has been terminated as it's superseded now by the fact that uh, Department of General Affairs officials will sit on the keg and keg LA representing all offshore islands. So we're looking forward to a closer uh, yeah. working relationship on sport offence. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And all, all the only point I would make about it is, is we've achieved precisely the result which we set out to achieve. Anything else would have, would have been difficult in the extreme. So any... any uh, Rista? Morena. Um, I was just wondering, um, she goes on to say in her letter that somebody would be appointed in the new year. Do we actually have someone from the senior, do we have a senior representative appointed to our regional group now? Uh, through the chair, yes, Mayor, we do. Uh, we have an appointed member who's attended their first corner executive group uh, last month. And we also have a member appointed to the Corning Executive Group Subcommittee of Local Authorities. Um, Richard Ward is on the CLEG and Richard Hardy is on the subcommittee. Thank you. Oh, well, well done. You've got precisely the input that we really required. So, well done. Thank you. Right, can somebody move receipt of the report, please? Gary did, I thought. I, and I, thank you. And I seconded. I so, so I've got, I've got Mayor Weber right at the bottom of my screen, and I missed it. I don't know how I could do that, but I did. So, so I'll take, I'll take you as, as moving, Mayor Weber and Mayor Rista. And seconding, raise your hand if it was in favour. Thank you, Gary. Right, Mayor Plenty CDM report of the annual plan. Dashboard is at the 4th of March 2020. Clinton, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, just wish, wish to remind members that as part of our reporting to the various committees of the Civil Defence Group, including this joint committee, um, it was an intent to provide more high level summary reporting rather than quarterly reports, which are often outdated by the time you receive them. And this is the uh, agreed uh, dashboard reporting that would be in every committee meeting. So it gives you a snapshot of all member local authorities and as well as the group of officers' progress on projects. Um, they are there meant for all members to uh, be aware of it. And I trust that all members have been briefed by their respective uh, staff, et cetera, around where they sit in their uh, projects. So that um, uh, the only comment I would make is despite the really significant challenges, COVID and all other events have put on us. A lot of event, uh, activities are really still tracking. So that's a good sign. Thank you. Yeah. Comments from anybody? Just a question um, yeah, through the chair, probably to you, Clinton, is there any issue that in our eyes automatically go to the not achieved cluster? Is there anything there that you think we need to take back to our own groups about a bit more more focus. Uh, through the chief, thank you, Mayor Chadwick. No, I think what this is achieving is that nice visibility of um, for each member to look at their dashboard and to go back and to see where we can support each other. Um, I'm quite comfortable that this dashboard, for example, is presented at a quarterly meeting of all the emergency management staff, then to the general manager level, then CEO. So. Each way we're tracking through and looking where we can support each other. So I'm really uh, pleased to see that this is a good tool for us to have those conversations. Um, if there was any need to bring something to the attention here for things, I would flag it. But at the moment, I'm quite comfortable where we see. Thank you. Any further comment? Any further comment? Thank you. Right. Can somebody move the receipt of the report, please? I move. Thank you, and uh, Deputy Mayor Isles seconded. All those favour, raise your hand, please. So, uh, uh, 
pass, thank you. Right, on to item 7.3, page 24. Bay of Plenty, Civil Defence, Motion Management Coordinator, revised terms of reference. Clinton, over to you again, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, the coordinating executive group under statute uh, is the committee, executive committee below this committee, um, and therefore falls to the joint committee to approve their terms of reference. The amendment that's been sought and made to that is a consequence of the minister's letter, where we've just adjusted the terms of reference to allow for DRA to be members of KEG. So I uh, propose that it's a, a, just a statutory formality to amend it, uh, submit those for approval here today. Thank you. Questions or comments, please? Will somebody to move? Quite, quite, quite happy to move. Recommend that we report. Thank, thank you. And then seconded by Mayor Rister. Those in favour, raise your hand, please. Thank you. Passed. Right, item 7.4, page 32. Statutory appointments. This is the normal one, which we have to do at this meeting by, by statute. Turns it over to you, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, as, as you've stated, it's a statutory requirement that all group and local recovery managers are appointed by this committee. Uh, I'll take the report as read. What we are seeking is to um, make the amendment to the group recovery manager. Uh, members may recall during COVID, I took on the role temporarily because we had a vacancy. Um, so we rescind, request to rescind me as a group recovery manager and uh, the current appointment of Janelle Coradine as an alternate to move her up to the group recovery manager role, um, then to appoint Anna Hayward and Michaela Gillespie for local recovery managers for Pokeke and Carroll respectively. Uh, we have one amendment that uh, slipped through, uh, additional resolution as appears on your screen, and that's to rescind the appointment of Ken Sutton as an alternate local recovery manager for Carroll. So the appointment of Michaela replaces Ken who's retired. So. Oh. Thank you, Chief. I move two, three, right. four, five. But every second okay. those. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. All those in favor, raise your hand. Thank you. Last. Right. On to page uh, 37, item 7.5, Regional Safety and Rescue Services Funding. Vincent. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the apologies from Sarah. Uh, of Lintzman from General Manager Regulatory Services Regional Council. Um, I will stand in as the Chair of the Rescue uh, Regional Safety and Rescue Services Funding Subcommittee. Um, just to re remind members that uh, this fund is administered by the Regional Council through a regional targeted rate, and um, the Regional Council sought the support from the CDM group uh, to help uh, evaluate applications. And that's just because the synergies of having local authority membership plus emergency service membership. So a subcommittee was formed. Um, that subcommittee consists of uh, the regional council uh, as a member, uh, two other councils who uh, volunteered to be serving on that committee, which is a Cody Key in Western Bay. And then we had police, St. John's and Fine Emergency New Zealand. So the subcommittee met to receive uh, the, and analyze the applications. Uh, I'll take the report as read. I just want to highlight um, the fact that the approach the subcommittee took was to look at the current budgeted amount of 400,000 per annum over two years. Um, it was a, a reserve amount, given that the current year, the previous, uh, the 400,000 wasn't fully utilized. So the subcommittee decided to split the reserve equally over the two years and give to be able to allocate out. Applications were received from Surf Life Saving New Zealand. Coast Guard, Rotorua Mountain Bike Club, New Zealand Land Search and Rescue, and Youth Search and Rescue. Just want to highlight that Surf Life Saving excludes Taranga because Taranga had indicated they were continuing with currently with a funding mechanism for Surf Life Saving in Taranga. The applications all uh, totaled exceeded the current budget allocations. So an analysis was, analysis was done, and the table there on 2.3 highlights how we uh, recommended attributing the funding out. We further recommended that uh, this committee uh, make a recommendation to the Regional Council to consider increasing that funding to meet the shortfalls that are being experienced. Um, I am joined by Graham Howard uh, from the Bay Plenty Regional Council, 
if there are any uh, technical questions, but I'll put it there and over to any questions. Graham, do you want to make any comment before we uh, before I put open it to questions? Uh, Cura, Cura uh, Councillor Love and Chairman. Um, no, I think I think Clinton has covered it, it very very clearly. Um, oh, the only point I'd make is that um, if if the committee does make uh, a recommendation for any increase in funding, that will go through to the regional council's deliberations meeting in May for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the only comments I would make is that. Um, I have a split personality in that I also chair our risk and assurance uh, and at which I am trying to reduce expenditure, not to increase expenditures. <laughs> but sitting here with my sitting here with my my CDNG hat on, that, that obviously I I, I, I I accept the recommendation. Mayor Chapel. Uh, yes, look, I I think it's a wonderful spread. I'm happy to move the recommendation, but it is a very good spread, and for us, I'm not being parochial, but 3.3, the assistance to our mountain bike club for their response unit is hugely well received. They go cap in hand to every, uh, every funder possible, um, and yet the activity in the forest is increasing uh, uh, daily. And they do well, and I just think it's wonderful that they will be so thrilled about this. So, you know, these bits, they're not bits, they're substantial. I agree with increasing the amount um, because you were oversubscribed and you always are. But these are the bits that wake our community up about the importance of mm. emergency response. And um, this is where they feel intrinsically involved um, rather than removed. And so it's a fantastic um, mechanism. I like the hands off politically. And um, I think you've made wonderful, well, the subcommittee's made really good investment. If I can just add the rider that we, Rotorua Airport Company, took on Airways New Zealand um, and one of our, and one in the Environment Court, and one of the reasons for not taking away our air traffic control was for our ability to respond to Lansar. Um, requests. If we lost air traffic control mm. at our airport, we would not have been able to do the Landstar search and rescue. That cost council a lot of money to have to take on Airways New Zealand, but um, it just shows you've got to keep your eyes about you for every little aspect of business. Um, and that airport is absolutely essential for us for our search and rescue. So um, they didn't apply for money. Uh, but I just want you to know that in, in relation to uh, the great services that these people do. Well, thank you for that, Mayor Chadwick. I, I agree with your sentiments on that one exactly. Mayor Turner. Thank you. I just I guess wanted to find out how does a, an organisation find out about this fund that they can apply to? Um, I'm just sort of wondering how, how well is it advertised or where is, how do people find out about it? Um, I would defer to Graham for that question where the Regional Council circulates it, but I know when the Regional Council made it available uh, aware to the CDM group, we promoted it through all our channels through the emergency services and asked them to share it with all affiliate organisations, because ultimately every organisation doing some form of safety and rescue service should be coming un in line with either police, St John's Ambulance, the fire service. Graham, do, would you like to add anything? Thank you, yes, just adding, we do have, it was pushed out through our participate site, which is where we can carry out all of our engagement activities through that, and then also contacting primarily the, the, the groups within each of the individual councils, which have a role with community funding, and so, as well as the um, emergency management avenues, also the community funding through council councils. We had a little bit of, um, of promotion, but we, and, um, just general promotion, but primarily we use those channels. And also we had um, a few respond responders to our last, last long-term plan. So we made sure that we include those, um, that group within that as well. Thank you. Mayor Weber? Yeah, I, I'm quite happy to second, second the recommendations and also applaud the process. 
Mm. Uh, I think you've taken a lot of politics out of it and you've, you've gone really to, to the heart of the issue and uh, fully thank the staff for, for, uh, for putting together the process. Well, thank you for those comments. Right, it has been moved and seconded. Uh, I intend taking the, 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 it all together. Uh, all those in favour, please raise your hand. Carried. Thank you. Right, now we jump in at uh, 7.6, as I said earlier, and we're on to verb updates. So this is where we uh, welcome Jackie Sinko from the National Emergency for Neva Regional Office. Jackie. Yeah, kia ora tato and thank you for that um, chair. So there's a few different updates from us. Um, I'll start with the trifecta programme. Uh, so as you're all aware, we've received feedback through that initial engagement process and um, I believe Clinton will take you through that later on. Um, thanks to Clinton for all of the work that he did on bringing together that commentary in such a short time frame. Um, the Minister has also held a hui with Māori in the emergency management sector and with mayors in February, which I believe some of you might have attended. Um, and she has invited people to another hui just to have the Bay of Plenty representatives um, and really open up a discussion with you guys. So that's on the 23rd of March. Thanks to those who can attend that one. Um, and alongside the legislative review, we're also working on the review of the CDM plan order and guide. And basically what we're gonna do there is develop a new version of the plan that's a lot more user friendly than the current one. The current one has sort of the order and council and commentary around it and it's um, quite legal and technical. So what the hope is with the new plan order and guide is that it'll be a lot simpler and more user friendly for people to pick up and work with. Um, and we're developing our strategy on how we're going to work with the groups through that process. So the next thing to talk about is COVID. Um, obviously, you're all aware that the wider system is under a bit of pressure. Um, and we're maintaining the posture that CDM's role is to support preparedness for concurrent events rather than being a primary responder in the response to the COVID resurgence. Um, as an organisation, NEMA has about 5% of our staff infected and affected, so we're really confident in our ability to respond at this point in time. Um, and you might have seen we had a public um, education campaign out which encourages people to get vaccinated and provides advice on getting prepared for COVID. Um, we've also got some other pieces of public education work underway. So the Ruamoko's Walkbook has been provided to around 740 Kura and Desar 1 to 3 schools across the country. And we're developing new preparedness campaigns um, targeted towards Māori, Pacifica and cold communities. And we also have updated the advice for disabled people on the Get Ready website. Um, we're building a new national tsunami map. So this is going to be an online map for New Zealand and it'll show if people are in a tsunami evacuation zone. Um, and we'll be working with the groups to work through some of the trickier technical aspects of doing this. Um, the mark. So we're currently standing up a 24 seven awake duty capability. And this will replace our current on-call duty system where we have staff who are um, also managing duty on top of their BAU roles. Uh, so we've recruited five watch leaders and 12 watch officers and the system will be stood up on the 30th of June. Final one. Um, so we've signed an MOU with the Ministry for Pacific Peoples and that's formalizing our partnership with them and the intent of this is, um, as NEMA, we are going to start developing a work program to support more effective disaster risk reduction for Pacific communities in New Zealand. That's all from me, but if there are any questions, happy to take them. 
I have to say, uh, Jackie, I'm delighted to see that we at last have got the 24-hour watch system in place. I always thought that was a real hole in the nation's preparedness. Uh, and at last, after lots of prodding from all sorts of areas, and, and we have done a bit of a lot, a lot of that prodding ourselves, I, I'm pleased to see it has been or will be enacted in June. Right, any questions for Jackie? Yes. There is the, your, uh, um, Jackie, yes, just wanted to go back to your comments around the tsunami map. Mm -hmm. um, when when is that? You said you were working on it. Um, could you give us a timeline for when it's available and when we can expect um, information for our districts, etc.? Thank you. Kia ora. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have a time frame yet. Um, we're still sort of working through the challenges of bringing together different data sets and zones and the way that um, the sort of 16 different regions have approached this differently. So we're still at the phase where we're working with the groups to line up the lines on the map and support um, the messaging around this. Mm -hmm. Yes, just um, thanks, Jackie, for the update. Just I'm aware it's Neighbourhood Support Week next week, and you talked about public education. Do you ever use their channels of communication because they're very connected um, and quite active for promulgating information, even if they just knew the links to your education program? Yeah, so I know at the local level, a lot of the groups are really engaged with um, neighbourhood support, and that can be one of their kind of key mechanisms that they use to get information out. Um, thinking particularly of Marlborough, that's quite a big one for them um, with having sort of an older population mm. in that community. Um, I'm not too sure at the national level, but I'll suggest that to our public information team. Thank you. Just the link. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just to supplement that question, uh, as Jackie said, a lot of the links to neighbour support are done through the regional and local engagement networks. And I can confirm in the Bay of Plenty, we are looped in with them. We provide them information and, and uh, for them to share with them, uh, their local level yeah. neighbourhood support groups. Thank you. No further questions. Would somebody like to move acceptance of the neighbour report? I don't move. Seconded by Merister. Thank you. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Gary, thank you. Right, update now from uh, Clinton as the Director of the uh, Emergency Management Bay of Plenty. Clinton. Thank you, Chair. Um, my update is going to be quite uh, concise. It's got two main parts that I would like to just brief members on. Um, and the first one is a is I just like to take uh, a lead off the update from Jackie at NEMA, and that is around the trifecta, um, as NEMA is calling it. So what I've just highlighted mm -hmm. there on the screen is, as everyone knows, the minister is engaging with. Um, our group next week. The minister's been doing a number of engagement, NEMA's been doing engagement, and that's around the first piece, which is the actual legislation, the Civil Defence Emergency Management Act of 2002, um, which is to be repealed and replaced with a new act. So that is a big piece of work that sets the arching, overarching of uh, legislative framework of how we work. Jackie touched on the fact that the National Defence that Civil Defence Emergency Management Plan of 2015 is also now under review, so that's going to be running concurrently. Um, but I also would like to draw attention to the fact that our own Bay of Plenty Civil Defence Emergency Management Group Plan 2018 to 2023 is due for review. This committee has already uh, approved our collective approach to that review. We are starting it early because it is our five-year statutory document. Um, and we want to do much more engagement with our communities and our iwi around that plan. Um, so we're not focusing on the minimum level of consultation. We 
want to do more engagement and helping uh, get the community and iwi uh, input into designing that plan. What that does mean for us, though, is that we've got three significant pieces of work running in parallel and interdependent. So many, uh, much of what's going to end up in our group plan will be directed and influenced by the legislation or the national plan. So the staff are, are going to be um, working on the timelines. We are just awaiting Lima to give confirm with us the timelines for the, the plan and the act um, so that we can align our planning to that. For members, I want to highlight that means we will need to start scheduling some uh, workshops across the spectrum, including with uh, the Joint Committee, particularly around uh, what we want to see in the strategic plan for us, but also what um, members might have input requirements for the national plan and the act, as we will discuss later today. Um, so I just wanted to flag this, that, and, and, and I appreciate, I know the pressure of local governments on there is a lot of reform happening at the moment, but I just feel sometimes the emergency management one drifts to the side, and I want to highlight how important it is that we give this some attention over the next uh, period. Um, the other key thing um, I am wanting to flag as we work through these um, proposals that NEMA is proposing to the legislation, to the national plan, et cetera, uh, will be to keep in mind where will the potential resourcing and financial implications lie, um, whether they be at the national level, the regional level, or the local level. That is the theme NEMA will be presenting throughout, is that there's a three-tiered uh, level approach to the legislation. So we, we are things delivered, and therefore, where are they resourced and funded? Uh, I do uh, keeping that as a highlight of concern and meaningful as we move forward. The second thing I'd just like to highlight, and again, touches on what Jackie was saying, is about tsunami readiness. Um, as members will be aware, of some time back, I brought to the committee the fact that I felt we need to prioritise this hazard because um, it currently sits in our hazardscape as number one and three of our top priorities, number two being pandemic, which we, we busy with as well. So for the Bay of Plenty, tsunami is a priority hazard, and we've, with approval from uh, the Corning Executive Group, we've implemented a dedicated role. Uh, Melinda Meads has joined us as a senior advisor, tsunami readiness, and Melinda's popped up there. I invite her just to give a wave. Um, what Melinda's role is, is to develop for us and start implementing a regional integrated tsunami readiness program where we are looking to take a collective approach, bringing in the local issues with the regional coordination issues supported by the national. Um, members heard from Jackie around NEMA's, uh, part of NEMA's tsunami program is a national tsunami map. And the fact that as Jackie said, the challenge there is not all 16 groups have done their modelling in the same format. Not all 16 groups have the same level of data sets, which makes it pulling it together into one national collective mapping system quite challenging. Melinda has already identified through her work, which has involved a scoping exercise across what national is doing, what our group and other groups are doing, and what local initiatives are to pull it together to look through and identify the interdependencies as well as where are the gaps, where are, where are things being done in a more siloed fashion so we can address those. Um, the other thing that Jackie mentioned was the 24-7 centre that NEMA is now establishing to monitor and give warnings and alerts for hazards. Equally, we welcome that, but um, at the same time, we would like to understand then what is the group slash locals role in the warning and alerting system going forward. Um, if the national system is 24-7 uh, awake, but regional and local are still running on duty systems, uh, we don't have an awake system. So we need to be clarified how does the overarching system now um, benefit from this. So what I'm flagging here is two things, is that Melinda is currently in the process of finalising the draft tsunami readiness program for the whole Bay of Plenty. That will be going through the, the channels and estimated to be back at this committee at your next meeting uh, for your uh, endorsement and awareness of what we're doing collectively across the councils. Also, 
would like to acknowledge that while we are developing stuff, we're also not just developing, we are actively doing stuff. And there's a lot of activities happening, but I would just like to highlight and give a big shout out firstly to Taranga City Council, um, who ran a tsunami awareness program over the summer holidays. There's a picture there where they employed a number of students at, as youth ambassadors um, who worked across the Taranga area at markets, etc., educating, advising, and communicating around the tsunami risk. So really great initiative that's going that happened there. Um, equally, the 5th of March. Uh, anniversary. So last year on the 5th of March, we had those three consecutive earthquakes that had for first time ever an evacuation of our coastal communities. We did an awareness campaign during that week, one of which uh, was Melinda fronting tsunami questions on radio, one double X, etc. We did a question and answer session on Facebook, um, and it was really encouraging to see the, the level of engagement that's happening with our communities. So there is a lot of detail there, but I don't want to drill down at this point into operational, more to flag with this committee that we are working strongly to prioritize this one, and we'll be coming back to you at the next committee meeting with a um, further detail briefing of activities that we are undertaking. Uh, thank you. Thank you for opening up the question, Clinton. Uh, can you just confirm uh, the status of Melinda, who she's working for, and is she a full-time member of staff? Uh, she, Melinda is uh, part of the Emergency Management Viability team, my team, um, and is currently on two-year uh, fixed-term employment to address this. The idea behind that is focusing, we do have currently 22 hazards in our group plan, and this is giving our focus to one specific hazard, and that's what Melinda is uh, looking to pull together, our most significant hazards. Well, thank you, Clinton. I think this is a, this is a welcome move ahead. Are there any questions or comments, please? No questions or comments. Um, Judy Turner, sorry. Like oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. It's just, just one point that we noted with the tsunami alert last time um, that I think uh, we, we're certainly giving some thought to at council, but I think it has some wider implications is that um, because we it's in, we can anticipate the receiving communities. So we all, in town, we all went up the hill into a residential com, uh, community, um, but it has no public facilities of any kind. Um, so we were reliant on the, the generosity of people having us into to their homes to use the toilet and get a drink of water kind of thing. But yeah, and I also have had conversations with some of the um, more inland communities like Minganui, who said, you know, they, they in a civil defence emergency, they are expecting that family anyway will be coming back. And they actually worries them that they don't have the capacity to cope with the additional numbers coming into town. I know Taniatua had a lot of people come in. So in our consideration, yes, we want to get people to safety, but actually some real genuine thought about investing in and in, in having ready those communities that are likely to be in receipt of those larger populations of people would be really helpful and they've signalled to me anyway that um, they would appreciate some input um, around what the, what to do and what support they can expect. Thank you. I, I, uh, at the last alert, I saw the effect of that, as you're describing, both for you and, and also down for a boat key. Um, yes. Uh, and certainly you've raised some really important issues there, and I'm sure Melinda has taken those mm. on board mm. and will be part of her work. Mm, thank you. Okay, right, um, Mayor Weber. Yeah, thank you. I think um, you made the comment earlier on, Clinton, about everybody being awake at Wellington 24-7. That's absolutely essential. But with tsunami, the, the critical issue is getting the communication out because of the technology that's through the Pacific in particular. We know it's coming, but we need a linkage back to our, our area because of the vulnerability that somebody's awake at this end. And I think we need to consider that somehow, that, you know, the tsunami will most probably get here quicker than our bureaucracy will be able to get through the process. So there needs to be a linkage between the, the centre and us that we can get this communication out really quickly, particularly for our low-lying areas. Thank you. Uh, through the chair. Thank you, Mayor Weber. I concur. Uh, wholeheartedly and um, that is my my point I raised earlier around while NEMA's 
investing in the Wellington or this, you know, the national level center, what does that mean for groups and local? How do we speed it up at our levels then? Mm-hmm. Um, and what does that system look like? So it's it's part of the system being addressed, but it's not the whole system. So we definitely are on the same page of, and Melinda's identified that, to, that's one of the work streams is to improve that communications out. Um, it's also a reminder that in, in a local source tsunami, it's unlikely any centre is going to get the alert up, which is why we still push that long or strong get gone message, you know, the natural warnings. Um, but where we can do official alerting, we want to make sure that we're all on in the same loop. So fully, fully supported it. Thank you. Absolutely. But I, but I take it one step further than that, Clinton. I think it's time we in the Bay of Plenty look at a 24-7 coverage with fens and a few of these other areas because of the vulnerability we have to tsunami, to earthquakes, and then the, 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 the other natural risks that are around us. You know, we've all gone through floods and earthquakes at some stage that um, it's time I think we actually realise that this is, there is a requirement for a centre with 24-7 coverage and, and spread the cost across the, um, the district. You know, we've, we've kicked the can down the road and, and yes, I hear the, the regional council trying to, trying to cut their costs. So let's make sure we cut our costs in the right area and, and not, not in this area, because this is absolutely critical to, mm-hmm. to protecting our citizens for these things that we don't know a lot about until they actually happen. But I'm supporting you to get more money, Clinton. Can I just make a comment there? I'm sure Melinda will uh, include this as part of her report and would certainly intend using that as a vehicle um, for for putting that into effect in the future. However, I think we need to have a discussion in in the shorter term and say in the interim, are we agreed that we ought to be doing that? And I think we would like to discuss that at the next meeting. Okay, Commissioner Rodston. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I just want to su- support Gary's comments um, about timing, I think. I mean, it's one of the critical issues of when decisions are made and when people need to move. So, you know, if we if we have an earthquake, you know, um, the response is uh, automatic, I think, from, from our communities. But uh, when there are events overseas and the timing of, um, you know, when, when community need to respond, I think that's probably the critical issue is... Um, that, that national response in terms of uh, communi- communicating back to our community in terms of you know, moving to high ground and those kinds of things. Um, I just want to make a comment about the, about the program we, we ran for Tauranga City. That was in response to um, uh, uh, engaging about our siren, essentially our, our um, tsunami siren systems. And, and we will be having a conversation with our community through, through our annual plan about whether we continue with that program. Um, but I think it was quite successful in that uh, we, we got a whole lot of students out to engage with the community about um, how we respond um, as a community um, to these types of events. Um, but I do pick up on the point that while that was a Tauranga City initiative, I think thinking more broadly across the region, I think is, I think is more important um, for our communities. Um, and just one last thing, um, in that event we had 12 months ago, um, we did get some feedback, particularly from our Māori communities that live uh, on the hills um, in and around our coastal communities. Um, they were inundated, inundated by um, people moving inland. Um, and we are, you know, we have been thinking about how we resource or support them because exactly the same um, same issue as Mayor Judy. Um, you've got people um, sitting up on hills, um, no toilets, no access to water and those kinds of things. And a lot of our Māori communities um, have have some of that in hand and are happy to support. Um, but we do need kind of that resourcing to, you know, to enable them to to play that kind of role, hosting kind of role. Anyway, kia ora. Any comments, uh, before we move on? Um, uh, yes, yes, thank you, Chair. Then I'll, then I'll come back to it in a minute. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I fully support that um, and your points and Mayor Turner's points around not it's not just about the evacuees, it's about those who then received the evacuees. That was a big lesson and that's a, a, one of the strong themes that Melinda's identified. We've also identified uh, initiatives done in other groups. Orcs Bay have one where they, they've already done working around the receiving communities. 
um, as well as uh, Tarafati have recently done work around empowering their marae that are on the border to receive. So we are in dialogue with them now and learning. Again, we believe don't reinvent the wheel. Let's learn from each other. Let's capitalize on the successes they've done. So that is a strong work stream in the pro uh, program we'll be bringing back to you is around what about the communities receiving. So, so my challenge to, to those uh, member councils who don't have a coastline, you're not off the hook in tsunami because you guys are the backup. You guys are the ones who are going to receive. You're going to be lending support back to the impacted council. So we're all in this one together. Thanks. Mayor Thank you. Um, yes, just following on from that, um, we did also um, run into the problem of um, coastal communities moving uphill. Um, and ending up on State Highway 35 uh, with actually nowhere to go, no local marae close by, etc. So I do know that that's quite a um, consideration for all Portiki District to ensure that we uh, work out what's going to happen next. Um, and from, from the, the fact that we did have the tsunami um, withdrawal last year. A couple of things that I learned personally. One, um, that I, the alarm was very good, but how many of us actually read the messages on the alarm? Um, and there was, when I look back at it, there was so much information, it took forever to actually work out what was um, essential for us as in, it was different for Oportiki, for Fakatani, for further around down the coast. Um, so that was, from a communication point of view, a difficult thing. However, we all left. I also felt that I would have liked to have seen from National, from NEMA, um, a shorter time that we were out. Um, if it was at all possible to have that um, all clear signal um, faster once information had come through. Um, because by the looks of it, when we looked back, there was probably a good hour and a half to two hours when we could have been released earlier. However, I am happy to be, stand corrected if um, information from uh, Anima um, wouldn't have been able to do that. But I do believe that um, that would have been essential for, for us. I'm, I'm so glad that we actually had that opportunity to do what we did. We learned so much from it, um, all the communities, and there was a lot of follow-up from it. And I'm also very pleased to see that it's a priority and that there will be continued educational activities um, and learning for our communities. Um, thank you. I've got um, Mayor Turner followed by Mayor Chadwick, but before, Jackie, do you want to comment at this stage or do you want to comment at the end? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just in response to Lynn, unfortunately that um, event was before my time at NEMA. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I can't be sure, but from what I understand, the risk would have been under assessment and it would have been a really delicate balance of keeping people safe and not releasing them too early and being really aware of wanting to get people back, but being cautious of not doing that until we were sure the risk had passed. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to follow up with one other point regarding the receiving environment is that Marae have the potential to be a hugely great opportunity and most of them are very open to that. Um, but some of them, would, um, the Marae need some upgrades. I know of a number of Marae that have been, as they've done their upgrades, they've had civil defence emergencies in their mind in terms of the design of, of their upgrades. So I just think in terms of where there's funding needs for things like upgrades. And I think uh, a couple of things that, that I've come across. One one was a, a marae that's uh, inland, uh, uh, Ruatoki, who are doing that. And they were saying that 
uh, when we had um, a couple of emergencies where people have ended up staying at the Marae, but they couldn't get supplies in. And they were saying they felt they needed a helicopter paid or somewhere where somebody could land and drop off supplies because the roads were, were blocked off. So there's a couple of things like that. And the other one was um, when we evacuated Edgecombe from the Edgecombe flood, uh, Kawarau very kindly uh, was one of the hosts and there was a big marae there that, that hosted us. Um, one of the concerns I picked up with the iwi at, that, at the hapu at that uh, marae was they were really nervous about the fact that somebody died and they had a tangi and they had all these people at the marae and, and all these services based there that they would need to transfer them somewhere else sort of mid-crisis. And so whatever, what Mariah are very open from my, from my experience, they're very open to helping out, but they have this little tension that shouldn't, if suddenly that Mariah was needed for a tangi, what, what, how quickly and responsively could we then move the services out of the Mariah we're in into, and into a neighboring one? So I just think for uh, Melinda's sake, I just wanted to, to say that Mariah are particularly uh, open to um, being useful in that space, but they have their own challenges that we need to be aware of. Yeah, thank you for that. Increasingly, since I've been on the committee, you're, uh, Mary and Marais have been were brought into the formal planning process and formal response process, which and I think that's only common sense and, and, and delighted to see it. Clinton, do you want any comment before I move to Mayor Chadwick? No, I think Mayor Turner summed it up very well, and we've, we've noted all those points in addition, um, and that, that's part of the, the work stream, is to work out how do we use them but how do we take into consideration their unique circumstances as well? Mayor Chadwick, followed by Mayor Campbell. Yes, I, do, I think there is another learning. It's great to hear mayors after the last warning for tsunami, but we'll be a receiving community. We're well aware of that. And there's some great lessons to be learned on the current pandemic COVID response about um, supply. So we were looking at our own capability about setting up an emergency operations centre. And we've worked with the DHB and we're giving out over 200 food packages daily. Council's right in the middle of this and um, working with MSD. So we've formed a whole new network. We've got uh, taxi drivers, courier operators handing out supplies to um, affected families. And when I think of Commissioner Rolleston talking about those communities that are hard to reach. Um, we've learned some amazing new ways to get in in our COVID response that I think need to be very closely tied into any emergency response. We're using a whole different set of networks and um, continuity, business continuity planning is becoming another uh, impact that we've got to look at. So great lessons learned from the tsunami warning, but also COVID, and they need to be pulled together. I've never seen an operations centre like we've got at uh, the International Stadium, and that is covering Taupo as well, uh, with an MSD link in there as well. So it's a great capability if we get a civil defence emergency. I just wanted to add, a, add that. Matt Campbell. Oh yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, good, good uh, put it all around this um, this uh, business of having to evacuate. And thank you, Mayor Chabot, because you you just uh, touched on something that I'm that come to mind uh, with the uh, with the tsunami warning that uh, Fakatani and them uh, the one Fakatani district and Edgecombe uh, had to evacuate. Uh, we ended up with about two thousand people here in our in the middle of our town not knowing where to go, what to do, how to go to the toilet, anything like that. And we had to open up our halls and give them cups of teas and all the rest of it, and that's fine. But what was concerning me is, is if, if, for instance, God forbid, uh, that tsunami had hit, what then? Because there might not have been anything for these people to go home to. And so that would have been a bit of an issue for us uh, at that particular time. So what... Uh, Mayor Chadwick has just talked about is something that we probably need to have a, a, a reasonable look at. Um, but the other thing also, uh, what concerns um, uh, inland uh, areas like Rotorua, um, Kawarau particularly, uh, and that's wildfire. Wildfire is something that is a, a big threat, and even around Mayor, Mayor um, Weber, I, you know, I get around in his district quite a bit, there's quite a bit of forestry area in there that needs to be 
to be looked at. But, you know, everybody could be running for the water rather than the hills um, in the future. So that's that's another thing that really does concern us here. But thank you, Mayor Chadwick. I, it's something we probably need to have a chat with your your lot over in Rotorua about mm -hmm. that, um, about that um, set up of, of being able to look after uh, evacuees um, in, in, in such an emergency. Good one. Thank you. Well, I think there's some superb information there for Melinda. Um, but, it, but of course, this applies not just to tsunamis, but right across sports and Clinton. Do you want to make final comment before I move acceptance? Uh, thank you, Gene. Uh, I think if all the points raised are valid points. And equally, while a lot of the work Melinda is doing is, as you've just said, around focused on tsunami, a lot of it is applicable to all hazards. So the work we do around evacuations and centres and receiving and supply chain, those can be applied, as Mayor Campbell said, to wildfire. If we have to evacuate people out of areas for wildfire. So all the learnings we're doing do have a benefit wider than just tsunami. Thank you. Any further comment or question? Now, therefore, would somebody like to move acceptance? Thanks, Mayor Turner. Seconded. Mayor Rister, thank you all in favour. Raise your hand, please. Thank you, carried. Right, now moving on to 7.6. Now, 7.6 is a little bit tricky in that part of it is in the open, and then part of it necessarily will have to move into public excluded. So, Clinton, I'll leave the explanation to you. But first, so we need to be... And, and if you could just guide the committee in, in what comments will not be appropriate in the open, uh, if you'd like to, if you'd like to move to 7.6 and lead us through that, please. Thank you, Chair. So um, for this committee, I would just like to highlight firstly, and Jackie touched on in, in her update um, around the trifecta. So the piece around reviewing the Emergency Management Act or the Current Civil Defence Act. Um, NEMA came out late last year with some communications around engaging what's called targeted engagement. Um, and that took the form of online sessions with um, the country. And those sessions were divided up amongst uh, inviting uh, political levels, so elected officials and mayors to, to forums. They also then uh, invited executive level, chief executives, et cetera, and then a third level was the practitioner level, so the emergency management professional full-time staff. So they, they targeted the three sort of levels um, and ran through the same sort of proposals to, to get feedback. That then resulted in, once they finished that in early January, um, they invited feed, written feedback to be submitted by the 11th of February um, through an online portal. The challenge was it was very tight to give um, to, for, for groups to get together and formalise formal submissions. Um, equally, NEMA at that time had indicated this is not really the formal submission process that's still to come. Um, this was more of an initial, these are the thinkings, the high-level proposals, thoughts and feedback on that. So um, I made a recommendation to the Corner Executive Group, um, given the timings that we focus on the staff level meeting and the CAG local authority subcommittee, which are your general manager level, uh, that we workshop those things and put forward a collective feedback for you, noting it's not a formal submission endorsed by this group, we, uh, time didn't permit. So we did that, uh, also noting that each individual member of council was welcome and did submit their own submissions. So while we did a bit of a collective view, um, there were also individuals done. So the, what you're receiving today is a summary of the submissions that are authorised back, or the sorry, the views that are authorised back as collective. That was where we were pretty much all in general agreement. Um, and that's put forward for you to receive. But what I would like to propose is that given the minister, uh, sorry, given the minister there after also had some hurries as indicated with EWI leaders, uh, and Maori advisors, as well as and who we with mayors from all over the country. Some attended those. The minister has now indicated she's going to do a virtual roadshow next week, and we are uh, hopefully everyone's got their invite for Wednesday the twenty third at two thirty. Um, 
My understanding is that the minister, it's not a formal agenda. The minister will make some opening remarks and then the minister will open it up for discussion. So there is a paper we will touch on a bit later, but initially I thought it might be of benefit uh, to remind members of what the current proposal sits at, as well as to flag where we have put forward a view or preferred option. Um, and I'm for the members here, I'm not taking you in detail. Appreciate this at this level. I'm going to give you the very high level principles um, and then flag for you where we, we got to. I would like to start off by acknowledging that in general, views from us supported by other groups was that very concerned around the timing and the, the number of reforms happening at the same time and the ability of local government and local government staff, civil defence staff, to really be able to analyse and uh, interrogate proposals. So that has been flagged uh, across all, all groups um, as a key one. The other one also is that while these are high level proposals, uh, often the detail is, is not there. So it makes it quite challenging to select an option without knowing the detail behind that option. Um, so we have to, at the moment, we are going very much in principle, you know, your initial reading of things. So if it's fine with the chair, I will run through a very quick high level summary and it might also aid members to remind members we in preparation for the ministers who are next week. Now or in public excluded. Okay. Right, please carry on. So the NEMA's title is Modernising the Emergency Management Framework. Um, it's a reminder that in 2016, government of the day announced a review into New Zealand's emergency management system. It was supported by all parties. That led to the formation of a technical advisory group who undertook a review and submitted a report in 2017, making a number of recommendations to the government. The government responded to that uh, in terms of what they were accepting and what they would action. So this is a journey since 2016. Um, around the emergency management system reform. And so where we sit today is the key piece around the legislation and, and the national plans that, the, that NEMA is working on. Um, it's a reminder that the new legislation will replace the current CDM Act. So uh, a very high level summary. Uh, the first one was the look at the functions of civil defense groups and local authorities. So this is a piece we'll touch more on in, in, uh, in follow up with the paper that just came from NEMA. But in principle, what NEMA was looking at, do we keep the current state, uh, which says section 17 gives us a, a list of functions that each group uh, must do, but it's currently worded as each group and its individual members. So there's no definition or clarification around what do you do collectively versus what do you do individually. It's, it's all grouped together. So that's part of the challenge of the current state. And then they propose three options. The first one being distinct local functions. The second one is a strengthened regional approach. And the third one, D being a regional approach with local support. Um, I've put a red star on to summarize for you where the current feeling from uh, initial uh, workshops is leaning for support again for D with regional approach that we work collectively together with local support. Um, and that's, the current uh, in principle supported option. Like I say, we'll discuss this slightly more shortly. Uh, membership of groups, a proposed change, a new feature in the legislation is that um, is to allow for Iwi and Maori representation on joint committees. So the current act is written very prescriptive. It only allows for the mayors um, to be members and the chair of the regional council. So it says one member and one member only. So legally, we have been challenged with trying to put this into place um, to give equal standing. So this is a new proposed change which we support, which is to bring in Iwi and Maori uh, representation. Um, the interesting there is they are in this proposal proposing that representation, representatives remuneration will be centrally funded. So the, again, comes back to that one of those funding issues that there'll be central funding support for this initiative. Um, and and if, if a little bit further on, 
it comes back to this point of how this will happen currently. So, um, but we are in support of this new proposal. Um, the second one, uh, sorry, the third one here is a addressing the question of the legal status of CDM groups. Again, the current proposal, the first one option is keep the current state in that groups, we are not legal entities, and I say we. Uh, the definition of a CDM group is based on yourselves as the joint committee. So the joint committee, the collective of uh, mayors and the chair of the regional council or delegate are seen as the definition of a group. The coordinate executive group below that, where emergency services join in, is an executive level to support the group. And then the group emergency management office, which is the role undertaken by my team, is obviously the delivery arm of the group. But it's to remind members that this is talking about yourselves um, when it's talking about the definition of a group. So the, what they've proposed as alternatives is firstly B, where the act gives specific legal status to groups, uh, or C, where there was a bit of a, a middle ground of requiring um, each member of council to give mandatory delegations to the group to enter into, for example, contracts. So where some of the challenges have come in is that if we are not a standing legal entity, we, we can't enter into our own contracts. In my office, any contracts we're entering into, um, whether that be through myself or through the Keg Chair, Russell George, through uh, Council of Love, have to be done through the, currently through the regional council as the administrating authority because we are not a separate legal entity. So again, uh, through the workshops, the prefer preference was is to give the group its own legal status. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, comments or questions at this stage? Yes. Uh, yes, just a question that um, I'm really concerned about the options. Can you go back to the option slide? Um, there's a bit of a fusion. You've got a preference. Uh, you had it local or keep the same local or, or regional. Right. Um, I wouldn't be so emphatic about, I, I get the regional approach. I totally accept that for civil defence and emergency um, response, but I, I wonder about locally developed and regionally led, because so much of what we do is done at the, the TLA level with our related organisations, and I like it being fitting into a regionally led, but um, it's a bit of B and D together, rather, do we have to stick to one option? Uh, Matt Chadwick, thank you. Very, uh, that's an observation we've equally shared, um, is that these sort of overlap with each other, and it goes back to that question around what is the detail? So I, I should have also flagged that what one of the, our feedback emphasised with the national agency is that um, the, pro the proposal that Civil Defence Emergency Management, or the, if we're going to call it the new emergency management framework, we're still going to be built on nationally supported, regionally coordinated, but locally managed. Um, and that theme is applied across each of these proposals. So we, we don't just want to focus on what's local doing. We want to understand what local will do, what the regional part will do to coordinate that, and then what national will do to support that. So we need to see the clear line between those three levels at all times. Um, but you're quite right. It's, potentially there's an overlap and a, a merger of some functions from B to some functions of D. Which could be a good discussion with the minister. And my, my other issue, if I may, through you, um, Mr. Chair, is, is really this, um, the TLA understanding and the regional understanding of, of Māori participation. And we've got it now. So you can't develop your local plan without talking about mana whenua, talking with them, mana whenua and hapu. I'm worried about that regional governance adding another layer and saying we, we just work with Māori entities. Uh, it's much more organic for us um, and, and those people affected. So um, I'm just not sure about how you get that right. I've, we've no problem with participation at all, but... Um, no, I, 
it, it really it really is a tricky area in my mind there's a couple of of st like sticking points or important principles oh, and one is the function of the mayors themselves i think in every emergency i've seen uh the mayors have stood up and been that focal point for the community <clears throat> and i think that's absolutely vital and that means they have to have an organization to support it and they have to have an organization which encompasses all the parts of 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 their fiefdom if you like so yes i am i am understand totally where you're coming from um and it's i i, I suppose the, the the attempt is to try and make something simple, which is an inherently complex. And I think um, we've got to make sure there is latitude left in the legislation to make sure that we can respond as and when, because as far as I'm concerned, no emergency is ever the same and no response is ever the same. And we need to take that into account in, in, in what we do in the planning for that. Mm. There, Weber. You think so? I'm I'm in a similar space. It's B, or B between B and D. And I, to me, um, let's learn from let's learn from Fakari because that 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 was a real issue which I observed as an outsider, and and I think it's time for cards on the table. That the confusion around that was who the hell was running the ship, and I think Judy Turner, you did a superb job in spite of the well-intentioned interests of other people who thought they should be in the photograph rather than yourself. And I think we need to get around that. And to me, it's regional national support for local action. You know, it, Fakari happened where it was and, and the people knew which helicopter could fly and which one couldn't. And, and the bureaucracy working out actually forgets the reality of the situation. So to me, Clinton, the, the critical thing is the clarity. What is the role of the mayor? To me, the role of the mayor is basically fronting the press. You don't want you don't want mayors anywhere near manning the pumps. No. Because that's not their expertise. So, so clearly identify your work. What is the operational role and who should be doing it? What is the governance role? And what's the PR role? And where do they all fit? But it's really that regional national support because there's stuff that can be done regionally where there are efficiencies. There's stuff that should be done nationally because there's real efficiency. But the actual, you know, the fire department that turns up with the pumps to fix the, the flood, they're, they're local. And, and, you know, they, they know how to run their own equipment. So it's, it's identifying or clarifying what is the role and who's best to do it. So there's no confusion. And I must admit, you know, I was up opening a cell phone tower with another mayor at the time we could see Fakari doing something different. That mayor felt it was appropriate for him to jump in a car and head down to Wakatani yeah. and see what, see what he could help. Well, it was better that he actually stayed up at the cell phone tower, in my opinion. <laughs> are we allowed, so Clinton, the question is, are we allowed to have I mean, why don't we propose a, we are the most affected um, region that, you know, certainly understands this stuff from what's happened to us. Could we ask for a bit of a fusion of B and D rather than just saying we go for D? Uh, through the Chair, Mayor Chair, yes, most definitely. Like I say, this is the process of dialogue uh, and I, I would put forward that one of the points can be raised with the minister directly next week. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what she's inviting for. Um, yeah. And we will obviously keep continuously updating as more information gets put to us and we better understand these proposals we can offer up. Uh, you know, it might be that we don't uh, support any of the proposals when we want to give a proposal ease. So that's well within our, our boundaries. Yeah, can do that. Yeah, so and we have... Oh, okay. So, Mayor Turner, what I, what I intend doing actually is, is, is uh, I've got Mayor Turner and then Christian Ronston speak, but I intend as soon as they have spoken it, it, it is to move acceptance of this part of the report and then go on to the second part, which I think we, 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 we're we beginning to get into uh, yeah. now. So, so uh, Mayor Turner. 
yes. Um, in my time, um, not just on me, but on council, is you know we've had a tsunami alerts, we've had an earthquake, we've had an eruption, we've had debris flow, and we've had flooding. So we're kind of quite cut. We're kind of used to getting being pretty agile in that situation. I, I, th I can I can name a number. We desperately need support. So I, I'm yeah. trying to. I think that the BD thing is probably the way to go. But I think you need to remember that the people most affected on the ground are looking to the locally elected people for the for for the messaging and the help. Um, they don't know anybody else, and so they're looking looking to us. Um, and the second thing is that we also do have a lot of local knowledge and, and I've been through a couple of situations where uh, when Tony Bond was mayor, I want to give you this example, when Tony was mayor and we, this was the Edgecombe flood, we had people in Kawarau and we had people at, um, in, a, in our war memorial centre. I base myself on different days out at Kauraia to sort of be that local person out there to support Kauraia Council, who are being amazing. Um, and then one day, the, the the powers that be decided that that the mayor should go out and speak to the people who are out of their homes in Edgecombe in Kauraia, and and then have a public meeting in Fakatani. They turned up. The one in Kauraia worked really well, but it really worked well because of the Marae and the Marae set the tone and the Marae got thing. And because people by then are upset, we're two or three days into it, they're now getting really upset and anxious and wanting to get, um, get find out what's happened in their home. And it went really well. I then drove back into town and saw a huge number of cars around the War Memorial Centre. Went in, and it was the only way I could describe it was close to a lynching mob, uh, with the mayor and the chief executive standing up the front being screamed and yelled at. And when I <laughs> couldn't believe what I was seeing, and, and what had happened was the people organizing it didn't think, oh, do we need a sound system? Oh, do we need this? So the people had turned up, it was badly organized. Nobody could hear anybody. Somebody found a little microphone that didn't work properly. It was a nightmare. And it just escalated and escalated and escalated. And by the time I walked into the room, I, you know, um, the mayoress was in tears because she thought her husband was going to be beaten up. It was a nightmare. So a bit of local organisation on things like that would have actually probably uh, got around that without it being problematic. So I think there's that the respect for that local voice and, and checking some facts out with local people as you progress this, the thing. I know the intention of that was great, but it was a disaster. And um, and and took us quite a long time to get over it, and, and there was a huge amount of follow-up that some of us had to do with individuals to calm that situation down. So I I, I just think that if we're not careful, that the local if the local if local cons consultation by the regional and national people who are there helping and they do a great job they want to don't want to sort of make like I'm playing them down at all but there needs to be that connectivity um, because otherwise I tell you what sometimes the best intentions can turn to custard really quickly if you haven't applied local knowledge to the situation yeah thank you for that Mayor Turner I have to say uh, we learn more from where we've made the mistakes and gone wrong than from where we got it right and certainly what I saw and heard from, from Mayor Bond, it, 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 was, it, was, it was a disaster within a disaster. And certainly that's part of the lessons learned. And that's why I say this, it, this local input is so important to, uh, to, to calming and informing the, pocket, the local population. Right, Christian Ralston. Thanks, Chair. Um, just, a, just a comment about these governance arrangements. Um, I do think we need to ensure that they align across, you know, in terms of what, what the government's doing in the RM space um, yes. and in other areas to ensure, particularly for Māori participation. I'm, I'm, I'm in favour of um, having Māori um, participate and, and ultimately sitting at those tables making decisions. Um, but I do think we need to be clear about how they align. Um, otherwise, we're going to end up with, you know, uh, different arrangements for different pieces, pieces of legislation. Um, and, and while they may have different focuses, uh, I do think there needs to be clear alignment. I mean, one of my observations with the reform program uh, that we've got going on at the moment is there's no clear alignment. So whether that's with um, what's going on with Three Waters, with um, RM, yep. coming out of um, future local government, and now this, it doesn't, need to, it doesn't need to align and connect and talk to one another. Anyway, so those are my comments in terms of those governance arrangements. 
I think everybody's violently agreeing with you uh, from all the nodding heads, actually. So, yeah, agree. Right, so what I'm... Pinson, have you finished your presentation on so far? And no, Chair, there's a few more things to run through before we Okay, can, well, let, yeah. let's finish that part then before we move on to... And we've dealt with the legal status. Um, a quick one, accessibility of group planes. I talked earlier about um, the fact that we have to review ours now, five-year statutory document. This one was basically an amendment being proposed that group plans must be published. Um, we've always published ours, so I don't, there's no issue with this one. It just was there was never previously a legal requirement to do so. Now they're making it, but we've supported the public option C, which is publish, uh, publishing our group plan and incorporating documents by reference, any supporting documents. So that's just a formality which we support. Uh, undeclared emergencies. Um, this one, again, nothing, in the, I want to stress nothing, any proposals taking away from the mayor's ability to declare emergency, states of emergency locally, or for the, the chair of the joint committee to declare for a regional emergency. But what was discovered is looking at response thresholds um, for undeclared events. So the current act is very strong on everything being declared. So when a declared emergency, certain things will happen, but there wasn't, there's a bit of gray around liability protection then when it comes to deal, if we activate, but we haven't declared a state of emergency. So what this is proposing is um, to introduce response results for when does something that's not meeting a level of declaration, but still requires a significant uh, response from local or group civil defense emergency management. So we've opted for option B for that to be clarified and to give protection to controllers and all staff working there. Uh, concurrent events, emergencies, that what we sort of talk about now where we've got we've got a COVID running and then we have a tsunami, and uh, which we had a little while ago, we had a, a tsunami response on top of a COVID, on top of a, a cyclone. So we get like three events coming at once. And what they're seeking to amend is to provide further clarity in the legislation around how do these different significant events that happen simultaneously, how do they interrelate with each other? How do you declare in one patch for a cyclone in the next uh, jurisdiction you're declaring for a, a flood, for example? So, again, we support giving more clarity around how we manage concurrent events happening at the same time. Uh, ambulance services, again, this I think this one is a, uh, unanimously supported in that the current definition of emergency services in the Act recognise police find emergency New Zealand, but didn't recognise ambulance service. So this is an amendment to bring ambulance into this definition, and we fully support that. Uh, we do have ambulance co-opted currently onto the Corning Executive Group, but by doing this, that means they won't be co-opted. They will actually have a, a seat at the table. Uh, lead agencies, um, they're looking to, the proposal is to put, again, in sort of a, the current the legislation currently doesn't go into this uh, area of who's leading what, sort of talking back to Mayor Gary Weber's uh, concerns around, you know, when we looked at events, who's actually leading it? And we've got to sometimes go look at different pieces of legislation or different pieces of supporting documentation to try and work out who leads what, what they're proposing now is to what they're calling put a hook in the act, not trying to identify it there, but making it clear in the act that there will be clear uh, definitions around who's leading what type of event. And we support having that clarity as well. Animal welfare, the uh, proposal here is to currently the welfare arrangements or all the powers that a controller gets and the functions they get uh, are aimed at the people, uh, rightly so, but it's been, it's felt that animals are currently not adequately covered here. And we also know that many times in evacuation, people won't go, the animals can't go. So this is to give us some more uh, latitude of making it clear that animals will be covered under the emergency uh, powers and legislation, especially around being able to be entering properties to rescue animals um, and that they can be um, taken out to a safe place. So that is supported. Um, we also know that there's a crossover here to the Animal Welfare Act and that, that might be needed to be looked at in concurrence with this one. 
Uh, disproportionately impacted people, that terminology has been flagged and NEMA has accepted that to address that. Um, pretty much what the, uh, this is a planning requirement, again, that, that the legislation will now make it a mandatory requirement on CDM groups to work with all those who would disproportionately be impacted in an event. Again, we fully support this because that's ultimately why we're here, is to work with those communities and, and that would be impacted through an event. So from my point of view, this is a given that that should be a key function of our planning process. So we support that. Um, the planning levels of emergencies, this talks more specifically to around what we currently call lifeline utilities. So that's your telecommunication companies, your fuel companies, your roading infrastructure. Um, and for uh, councils, this is when you put on your other hats, not your civil defence hat, but you put on your lifeline utility hat. So it's about your three waters, it's about your roading, it's all those key services you've got to keep running under legislation. So there's been a lot of consultation on this separately with the lifeline utilities. Uh, the first proposal is the name change from lifeline utilities to critical infrastructure. Um, and then around this is basically saying that anyone, any organisation that's deemed to be a critical infrastructure or lifeline utility must have a level of service planning. So they must be able to plan for a minimum level of service they can maintain in an emergency um, and making that uh, publicly available. So we support that in concept. And then again, leading from that, if they do publish those levels of service, that there's a monitoring and evaluation mechanism behind that so that they must report to um, an agency yet to be determined that they are they've got the resources and capability to meet that. So can they keep the power on in an emergency? And what are they doing about it? Um, so again, we support in principle, although we do have requirements of, again, where will the monitoring aspects sit? Who will be the sort of auditor of this one? Um, this is coming back to the, the, the partnership with, uh, with Maori in the emergency management system. This is a new proposal that they're looking to propose establishing a Maori Emergency Management Advisory Group, or MEMAG, at the national level. Um, so it outlines what the initial thinking is that this group would be uh, in legislation established to support NEMA, to give advice to NEMA on various aspects involving uh, Maori participation, iwi participation in emergency management. It further says they will also be available to provide guidance and uh, advice to us at the group level. Again, we support this in principle, though we do have concerns around what that would actually look like. And coming back to Mayor Chadwick's video observation is how do those relationships apply across the different levels when the local have the actual face-to-face -face relationship? So then as you go up to the regional, to the national, what does that relationship look like in regards to ours? So that alignment, what Councillor Rolston talked about earlier, is how do we align that? But the principle is we believe an EMA does need an access to an, an advisory committee that can assist them. Joint committee, um, this is picking up that earlier legislative change to allow for iwi uh, Maori representatives on joint committee. This one here goes a little bit further and proposes the change that there will be two members elected with full voting rights to joint committee. Uh, the proposed new uh, advisory group at National will get guidance on the electoral process and that membership expenses and fees will be funded centrally. Again, we support that in principle, uh, but we have concerns, for example, two members, but we've got 39 iwi. So how does that work? Um, and then for the national to give us guidance on electoral process, we've sort of said, no, if there's going to be some process run that's centrally funded, then it must be centrally run as well. So don't just give us the advice on what to do, you actually do it. Um, but that's getting detail that would need to be worked through. Um, that flows down to the coordinating executive group, the chief executives. It's also proposed in legislation to, ma uh, to mandate that uh, Iwi Maori will be involved at all coordinating executive groups as well. And uh, again, we support this. Our group has, for some years, uh, allowed for um, an Iwi Maori representation on our coordinating executive group. The challenge again has become the how. 
where do you establish that regional sort of representation at that level and how does that then align to the locals? Um, interesting on this one, it stated NEMA will undertake an analysis to establish a funding mechanism. We've, on that point, we pushed back and said, no, it must follow the same as for the previous recommendation that it's centrally funded. Yeah. Iwi Maori function, a new proposed change again with Iwi Maori coming into uh, being recognized in the emergency management system. They're proposing to introduce requirements in legislation that group members, uh, groups must identify, work with Iwi Maori to identify their needs, develop plans to address those needs, identify the contributions that Iwi Maori can make, and communicate this. Again, we support this because that's the way we already have been going. Um, this is this is more in one way. A lot of these proposals are formalising what we're already doing. So we've been doing stuff without the formal recognition. This is doing it uh, the other way around at the moment. Consultation on CDM group plans and strategies. A new proposal again is talked about earlier. Our group plan that we're going out for consultation uh, to develop and engagement. This. New proposal makes it again a mandatory requirement for CM groups to engage with Iwi Maori on developing our plans. We've already uh, brought a proposal for a new group plan review to this committee, which suggested exactly that in the absence of legislation, we've already adopted that approach. So we support this because, again, it's formalizing what we're already doing. A couple of additional proposals that they put in, uh, or two. The first top one was around a proposed change to include specific roles for Iwi Maori in the system. So at the moment in the national plan, there's a, the, the role of the New Zealand police, for example, is defined, the role of fine emergencies to fine and so on, all different entities. So they're uh, proposing to include there in the role of Iwi Maori. Um, again, in principle, we support this with the concern though around Will Iwi and Maori be supported and enabled to deliver those functions? It's no good just putting a function in and then Iwi and Maori aren't able to deliver that function requirement because they're not resourced, uh, financially supported, etc. cetera. Um, and then the second one was around proposal was many of you may have experienced already where we've been doing a lot of events, responses where Iwi have been very supportive, uh, especially in COVID and other events where we, they've done the welfare stuff for us. Uh, they've led that to the uh, Iwi and wider communities and have incurred costs. At the moment, Iwi can't put a claim for cost reimbursement to government because the current rules say that only a local authority can. So we have then Iwi have to put the claim to us. We have to process the claim and then on for reclaim from central government. So the proposed change here is to allow a mechanism for Iwi to claim directly from central government for, for funding record. We support that streamlining that process. Um, these two additional changes, um, the first one is modernizing the purpose statement of the Act. We support the new Act does require a new uh, purpose statement and clearly we it now brings in recognition of the partnership with uh, Maori and the Iwi. And then the second one, in, it will be really bringing in a clause into the legislation which allows the Chief Executive of, of the <coughs> National Emergency Management Agency to uh, make rules. Um, but they talk about here peacetime rules. So in a response, it falls to the controller, national controller group, controller, local controller. But in peacetime, they're looking for those chief executive to be able to bring out rules uh, to set standards and uh, for the country and mechanisms that we all need to work together. Again, in principle, we support that with the caveat that any rulemaking will be done uh, determined in collaboration with groups and local. Uh, so we'll have a say in those rules. That's a quick high level uh, reminder of what some of the proposals were. There's a wealth of information there. Um, the only point I would like to ask Clinton is, is I want to make sure that in all this detail, the TLAs are given adequate capability to advise uh, on all these various issues. Should, should, it, should it be important to them to do so? Yes, Chief, all information that is received from 
Lima on this process is shared with all the mayors, with the chief executives and the staff. So we are we're working collectively uh, to support the, all the group members to address these concerns. Any further questions or comments on this part before we move on? No, thank you. Right. Would somebody, if I like to move the recommendation on page uh, 59, receives it receiving the report? Mayor Mr. and uh, Mayor Weber, raise your hand in favour. Barry. Right. We are now uh, going to move into public excluded. I move to move into public excluded. You can have a seconder. Deputy Mayor Isles, right. All those in favour, raise your hand. Right. Can you stop recording now, please, Marinda?